Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting for March 23rd. Hope folks are doing well. We've got some good updates and demos to share today from the team. So let's hop on in. Uh, from our research team, Spencer McIntyre will be walking us through the latest and greatest with framework today. Spencer? Yep. Thank you, Pierce. All right, so we have a few new modules that we wanted to highlight. Uh, first up is a RCE exploit uh, brought to us by our own William Vu, along with a multiple community contributors. So this was a fantastic collaboration targeting CVE 2021-21972. And I will be demoing this uh, later today. Uh, up in addition to that, we have an AMF deserialization RCE within the HPE Systems Insight Manager, uh, which exploits CVE 2020-7200. Uh, this was kind of an interesting exploit because we don't see AMF deserialization um, all that often. So that was kind of an interesting exploit module there. In addition to that, a, a slightly older uh, vulnerability got added into uh, Metasploit with an exploit for uh, the Microsoft Windows RRAS service that targeted CVE 2017-8461. And this was another one uh, from the Equation Group and the Shadow Brokers leak that came out a few years ago, but was uh, not quite as popular as some of the other ones that came out in that group as well. But now we have that expanded coverage, uh, thanks primarily to B. Coles, along with uh, Victor Portal. Finally, uh, <clears throat> Returning community contributor Eric Winter uh, brought to us a SR client DLL hijacking technique on Windows Server 2012. Uh, now, this vulnerability relies on a writable path entry within the server and is exploitable given that precondition, uh, but is also going to potentially see reuse as a DLL hijacking technique that could be combined with other vulnerabilities that allow an arbitrary file system write, which we are seeing more of these days. So a very interesting technique and a module there that demonstrates the vulnerability and isolation. All right, and uh, with that, we have a number of enhancements and features. Uh, Calba Security implemented a new MSF console command uh, for favoriting modules, which makes it easier for users to uh, bookmark modules that they utilize in their own custom workflow and adds uh, a better UI in for that. Uh, I myself made uh, a bunch of changes to the Java deserialization mix-in, uh, primarily addressing issues where commands had invalid characters that would have to be worked through on a module by module basis. It is now handled by the mix-in and uh, all of the existing modules were updated to utilize that. Uh, community contributor JSLAN updated the Linux x86 exec payload to now utilize Metasm instead of a pre-assembled blob that was in the payload. Uh, it makes the source code a lot more readable, as well as they added in a null byte free variant of that, so that if you have an exploit that doesn't that needs to avoid null bytes, the payload is capable of handling that on its own without any kind of encoding, which is very nice. B. Coles kicked off what, what turned out to be a slew of Nagios updates that uh, are still in progress with improvements to the exploit Linux uh, Nagios exploit for the Magpie debug module. Uh, in addition to that, B. Coles also submitted improvements for the Dupe Scout Enterprise Logon Buffer Overflow module. So huge thanks to him for helping us maintain some of those older modules. Uh, Security Curious updated the uh, Firefox credentials gathering post module. Uh, so it now works with newer, uh, with the profiles that are generated from newer versions of Firefox. So a very welcome addition there, keeping that up to date. And newer contributor, the Sunrider improved the WordPress users support to work with uh, later versions of WordPress. So now the uh, user identification works with versions up through 5.7. Uh, we also have a number of uh, bugs that were fixed. Our own Grant Wilcox updated 11 modules that were improperly checking the environment architecture in post modules, uh, which fixed a number of check methods and exploitation primitives. 
in addition to that, our own uh, Dean Welch ensured that the, the BIN data library is always available for use within modules. So any module that's dealing with uh, binary data and the BIN data structs, which is a, a newer form of dealing with that type of data, doesn't have to worry about that anymore. Community contributor Astute Joe fixed up multiple issues with the HTTP traversal scanner. Uh, community contributor Cap Me fixed uh, an issue in two modules uh, targeting an older CVE, CVE 2010-4221, which is a, a buffer overflow vulnerability within the telnet provided by the Pro FTPD daemon, where the version number uh, was triggering false negatives within the check method for that. So that has been updated. And now the, the module will correctly identify uh, versions that are, are vulnerable. Uh, our own Dean Welch fixed an issue with the DB import functionality, and Shelby Pace fixed a Ruby compatibility issue uh, with one of the newer changes for the Meterpreter error messaging format, so that works on uh, older versions of Ruby now. IMWR fixed up a couple of Unicode-related bugs in our post APIs that was affecting uh, paths that had Unicode characters in them. And Alan David Foster corrected a few instances where module documentation was not using the correct uh, naming convention, which prevented it from being accessible to users within uh, MSF console. Dean Welch additionally fixed a loading issue with uh, the RexML library, uh, again, making sure that it's available for use within all of the modules necessary. Uh, Jeffrey Martin fixed up an issue where exploit exceptions uh, other than interrupt would skip proper cleanup. And I believe that was one of the things that he alluded to in the pro update just recently. Uh, Frederico uh, fixed the impersonate SSL module. Um, this was, was presented as a fix, but it almost seems like a, a significant improvement where the impersonate SSL module can now handle SNI, which is a, a technology that's becoming increasingly popular in hosting environments. Now, this impersonate SSL module can target uh, servers that are using SNI or the server name extension to have multiple certificates uh, for different host names on, on the same server. So uh, great improvement there. And finally, uh, Dean Welch fixed up another auto loading issue with the uh, MSF RPC client for that affected external tooling. So as always, a huge thank you to all of the community members that made all of those fantastic improvements, the new modules, the, the bug fixes and maintenance, everything there. So a huge thank you to all of them. And the latest and greatest can be uh, found on blog.rapid7.com under the weekly Metasploit wrap-up that we post uh, every Friday. So huge thanks again to the uh, community members. And with that, I think it is time for some demos. Uh, so Grant Wilcox has a, has a few demos here to show us, and then we will have an exploit uh, later in the demo series. Grant, are you ready? Yeah, apologies if there's any background noise. Um, hopefully I'll try to keep this to a minimum. Um, so yeah, this was an update for the um, one of the search commands. Uh, previously, there was a lot of feedback from customers saying that, hey, the search functionality works great, but we don't actually have a way to really organize these search results. So if you just play the video here, um, basically one of our contributors added in a bunch of uh, options uh, new contributor pinport AT um, added in a bunch of fixes that allow us to search by different categories and then also reverse the search order. Um, so you can see if we just search for shell shock here, it will just show an unordered list of results. So no order to it. It's just whenever, whatever it outputs. Um, we can then sort it by rank. So you can see, okay, now we've got the rank in, um, Ascend in order, so it goes from low, normal, excellent, and previously it was unorganized. Um, so if we just scroll down, and then we can also add the minus R option. So if we want to reverse the order, so just have the top ones first, we can do that as well. Um, there's also a bunch of other options here. So if you just want to fast forward the video a little bit, I know it's a little bit of the video. Um, you can see we can also sort by disclosure date, name, um, as well as whether or not the uh, module has a check or not. Um, all of those options are 
in the help menu now. So if you do search minus help minus H, um, you can see all of the different options that you can search by. So rank, date, disclosure date, uh, name, type, and check. Uh, we may add more options in the future, but for now, these are the, the ones that are displayed in the output. So um, while you could search for other options and have it sort on that, it might not be as apparent to the end user that um, you can search on that. So yeah, that's pretty much the demo. You can just pause the video there. Awesome, thank you, Grant. I can definitely see the sorting by the disclosure date being uh, pretty helpful. So you can see which are the newer vulnerabilities or potentially the older ones that are in a particular environment. Uh, any questions for Grant? What's the default search option? Sorry? What's the default uh, if you just do search? Does it does it sort by any kind of, you know, does I it do it by the special there is any sort, any default option. Um, I'm not actually aware of what it's, uh, or is it by, de by default. I believe it's just whatever comes across in the database, um, whichever yeah. result it hits first. Neat. All right, cool. I think you have another demo for us, Grant. Are you ready to show us the WordPress library updates? Yeah, so this is another update by one of our community contributors. Um, essentially, what was happening before is there was a lot of requests from users regarding um, old WordPress, sorry, newer WordPress versions not being supported by our scanners. Um, so this was causing a lot of trouble because users were basically going, hey, I'd love to, you know, check if I can log into this WordPress website or if there's any like issues with the WordPress site, but the scanner was not working on them because of some API changes that WordPress made. So if you just want to play the video here. Um, so you can see we're just connected to the database. Uh, we've got no credentials in it right now. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and add the username and password here. So one's going to be a fake username and password, and one's going to be the actual one, which we can just see here. And I'm just going to go ahead and load the module. And what we're going to do here is just instruct the module to use all of the database credentials. Um, this will ensure that the credentials that we have added into our database will be used. And also ask us to scan for all the users that we have in our database. Um, now I have set up a doc container here, um, which has the latest WordPress installs. So this will be 5.7 at the current time. Um, the, mod, the, the mixing may work with later versions of WordPress as they release them. Um, it depends on whether or not the API changes. If it remains the same, it will still work. So I'm just going to show you this is the normal website. And then if you go to the um, to just the bank WordPress page, if you go to the WP admin site. Sorry, Paul, you can see it's a valid void for slogging. So we're just going to go ahead and scan that. And you can see it's the correctly detected the version is version 5.7. Um, you can also see that it found a valid username. So it found a valid username a test, and it correctly found the password, which is test123. So yeah, sure. uh, that was the update and that's the demo. And here I'm just gonna show you, it does actually work. So if we type in test, test one, two, three, and then try logging, it logs in successfully. If you want to just pause the video there, that's fine. Awesome, thank you, Grant. <laughs> So it's an important plugin. It's important that uh, we keep that up to date for the latest versions.
All right, uh, then we can go right on to the uh, UTF-8 improvements for the uh, handling of those characters in Meterpreter. Yep, so this was an update by our community contributor, Tim WR. Um, sorry, Tim, for misspelling your name earlier. I know we accidentally did that, but uh, anyway, if you want to play the video, someone, um, basically, this is a common request from some of our international users that we don't properly handle um, UTF-8 characters. Uh, keep in mind, this is not a golden bullet. It does not solve all of our issues, but it will solve some of the common ones um, that users have been encountering. So right now I've got, um, oops, let's close down. We've got uh, um, a couple of Unicode characters here. So let's just say we want to make a directory with uh, an emoji, for example, which is an example of the UTF-8 character. So before we try to do this, if you just pause the video quickly, um, it will essentially, what would happen here is you would, you would get an error saying that you can't encode to a ASCII. Um, whereas now we can actually create directories uh, with whatever eight UTF-8 characters that we want. So if you just continue the video. So now that we've created this directory, we're just going to navigate into it. And I'll show you that some of the other commands that also were failing before still work. So we can see the into that directory. Uh, we can use the print working directory command to showcase that we are actually in that directory right now. Um, so I didn't have another character to use, so we're just going to use this one. Um, but you can just uh, type in a sample piece of text. Um, and then if we just cut out the contents of that file, you can see that it now works. So before, again, this would also fail with the same uh, encoding error. And you can also get the current directory as well. So this is quite useful for those systems that support UTF-8 or international users who may want to use something like Chinese characters or Russian characters or whatever other language that they're currently using. Um, we also updated the download command. So um, you'll see there is a small error here. We are aware of the site now um, and we are trying to get a fix into it for it. Um, but if you do just do a download, so we're just going to change the directory back. And then just download all of the files from there by using the star character. You can see that it will download those files successfully. Um, so this is, again, useful for if you have uh, international files named files that you want to download. Um, and I'll just verify this here that if we exit out of our interpreter and then attempt to cut that file. It has indeed worked as expected. So if you just want to pause the video, that's pretty much all I wanted to show. But um, yeah. As you can see with that error, we, we do have some areas that still need improvement, but hopefully this should help uh, the majority of our cases that most users are experiencing. Any questions? Awesome, thank you, Grant. Yeah, the internationalization is actually also something that we are potentially looking for uh, working with Google Summer of Code contributors. That's uh, one of the major points in the post API projects. So kind of interesting to see a tie into that there. I think we have one more demo. Yeah, so this was a, a PR from B calls. Um, Really just a quick demo of this, because uh, you did make quite a few changes to the module. So if you just want to play the video so on, um, I'll just explain while some of the setup occurs um, for the video. So basically, this was a exploit for the Nagios, one, one of the old Nagios XI um, vulnerabilities. We have been getting a lot more community work on Nagios. Uh, 
vulnerability is as of late, so it's nice to see that this is being updated to be a bit more modernized. Uh, thanks, because for that. Um, so yeah, basically we're just going to go ahead and set up the um, the target for this. I'm very sorry that the text is so small that no one can read that, but uh, you don't really need to know too much about it. And just grab the IP address here. Um, Sorry. Um, and then basically what because has done with this PR just while typing in the information is he's allowed, um, he's updated it to make it a bit more modern conform with a bunch of our standards. Um, some of the error handling that was not working so well before has now been improved. And one of the most important things is this module now contains a check method. So you should be able to check if the target is vulnerable without necessarily exploiting it. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and set up the options here and I'll just show you that it um, now outputs a lot more useful information to the end user um, and also has it has the check method so we can see the target appears to be vulnerable. Um, oh, one other thing I didn't mention. Um, he also updated the exploit to contain a bunch of other upload paths that can be used. This will allow the exploit to work on older versions that are also vulnerable to the vulnerability. Um, before it would only work on certain uh, specific Nagios XI versions. Um, so this should expand the uh, range of uh, vulnerable targets that this module can exploit now. So as you can see, it, uh, it has got uh, quite a bit of detail information containing what it's uploaded, what it's tried, and um, the privileges that we now get. So, uh, One other thing I should mention is, although we got a uh, root in this scenario, um, because also made an update so that, um, if you just pause the video here, um, you can see that the first line says uh, that we got the code execution as a normal user. Um, previously, if that privilege escalation to root failed, the session would actually terminate. Um, you would not get a session at all. Uh, the calls made an update so that if the privilege escalation does not work, you will still get a shell. It will just be as the low privilege Nagios user. Um, so that ensures that regardless of if the privilege escalation doesn't work or not, you at least still get a shell. Some nice updates there. Thank you, Grant. That was. All right, I have a new module uh, to demo the VMware vCenter server unauthenticated OVA upload. It's quite the mouthful. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and utilize uh, this module. This module leverages uh, an unauthenticated API that allows us to upload a file and then obtain code execution on the remote server. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna utilize an existing module to fingerprint that the VMware vCenter is running and do a version check on it. But we're also gonna to check to see that the API endpoint is accessible, showing that it is unauthenticated, proving that uh, the target is remotely vulnerable. Uh, so the code's running through here pretty quickly, um, but once we had that in place, then we knew that we were able to uh, access that endpoint uh, without any kind of authentication. We're gonna go ahead and upload our OVA file and within a uh, matter of a few seconds there, it's then going to execute our JSP payload, which gives us code execution within the context of the vSphere user, which is what we see down there. Uh, we have our shell running uh, within the context of a, a vSphere there. And of course we had, uh, we had no authentication. Um, after that command shell is open, if you see there, it is deleting up the files off on disk. So the exploitation process is pretty clean. Powerful stuff. And uh, Brendan, are you ready to show us the server 2012 DLL hijacking? Certainly. Uh, this uh, this exploit relies on a misconfiguration. Uh, 
Uh, so to be clear, this is not something that works directly out of the box, but we all know that uh, there are no servers that are misconfigured, right? Um, so if you go ahead and run it, what this relies on is the Windows update process uh, blindly tries to find a DLL file anywhere in the path. So if someone has added a uh, directory in the path that you've got right access to, you can place a DLL and go ahead and trigger this DLL to get loaded by Windows Update itself. Uh, this is one of the strange ones. Uh, as you can see here, uh, I've got nothing up my sleeve. I've got a session on this machine. Uh, go ahead and look through the options. It's really straightforward. There's an option for stealth only. There are two ways to, to try and launch this. Uh, one of them involves a uh, popping a new window on the screen. So stealth only will try and make it quieter. As you can see here, there's permissions. Uh, C users, MSF user is a low privileged user, the user that I had my first session with and their uh, home directory was added to path. And so uh, as you can see, we went ahead and ran it uh, and we got system. Any questions? Oh, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this has been reported to Microsoft and Microsoft announced this is not actually a bug, so it will not be fixed. Appreciate the, the love, extra detail there, Brendan. <laughs> Good to know. Awesome. Thank you, Brendan. Cool. All right. And with that, that concludes uh, our framework update. Yeah. Well, thank you, Spencer, uh, for walking us through that. And thank you, uh, Spencer and, and, and team, for all those great demos. Uh, fantastic stuff. Really love seeing the the progress uh, and the new stuff that, that comes along in the framework. Always, always exciting. Uh, we'll roll over to Attacker KB, uh, the Attacker Knowledge Base, a website for discussing which phones matter and why. Just visit attackerkb.com. Um, I will hand the virtual mic over to Matthew Kino for uh, just a quick update there. Matthew? Hey. So we've been a little quiet, uh, I think the last uh, meeting or so, I wanted to give a quick verbal update on the work that's been going on. The team has been diligently at work on um, some new features, um, two of which you should see soon. Uh, this is enhancing Explored in the Wild. Currently Explored in the Wild is uh, a single report uh, by one user with no information associated with it. This is being expanded to allow multiple reports as well as provide a source of information with reference. This sort of builds into the whole ethos of Attacker KB, which is providing, providing information from users to other users about where they came to these decisions. Uh, so we're excited to give uh, more capability around Explode in the Wild. And also we're taking care of some technical debt with uh, site performance. You may notice uh, periodic uh, or intermittent load time changes uh, today. Uh, we're working on ironing those out as sort of dealing with uh, some technical debt that we've had as we moved forward. So we're excited to get these changes wrapped up and deployed to our users soon. Cool. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and with that, we'll roll over to Sonny for an update on some MITRE ATT&CK group's work that uh, he's been doing. Sonny? Yeah, certainly. Um, Pierce, if you'll allow me to share, um, I can show a couple things. All right. So MITRE ATT&CK groups, you may be familiar with the MITRE Corporation uh, and their ATT&CK matrix. Um, which kind of enumerates the different kinds of techniques that attackers use. And we've actually added um, right, tags around that in attacker KB to be able to uh, list the MITRE tags that are associated with the tags. In addition to that, MITRE also publishes something called MITRE attack groups, um, which they define as a related intrusion activity, basically, Things that are that are reported 
uh, through open source um, of valid, you know, references and citations of things that are exploited in the wild by different groups. And you may be familiar with some of the uh, the names. Um, it's kind of like the, you know, the also known as names like Blue Mockingbird and Cobalt Group, for example. And the idea here was that we want to highlight, right? We're always uh, trying to figure out, for example, from a vulnerability management point of view, what vulnerabilities should we fix first? And so as a first step to enhancing attacker KB is to be able to list for each of the topics, right? Which is pretty much one-to-one -one with the CVE. What CVEs are being attacked by these various groups? So the website here publishes things like, well, this particular group um, is known as the, also known as uh, the Cobalt Group, the Cobalt Gang, and the Cobalt Spider. So there's, you know, aliases within that group name, and then the different techniques that they use to exploit uh, vulnerabilities, as well as other things like software. My, yeah, here we go, different types of software. So long story short, the idea here is to be able to um, enumerate the different groups that are attacking various CDEs. So they publish a GitHub repo that's open source uh, called the Cyber Threat Intelligence Repo. And all of that information that's in that website is basically um, published here in something called a STIX format, which is just really a, a fancy JSON format for structured threat information expression. Um, and really what it boils down to is because you have different relationships, the data is really a directed graph that they publish and they will have domain objects like the, the particular group and the relationships. For example, a group uses techniques or a group, the relationship here is uses software um, or uh, you know, software uses this particular technique. So the idea is that while they do provide a vulnerability object type, which would be, you know, a CVE, for example, they don't really publish that. So the task here was to actually traverse the graph and search by regex for CVE IDs and then walk the graph and basically enumerate the groups uh, and what CVs uh, they're attacking. So long story short, on the left-hand side, um, this is what the stick format looks like. It probably was once, you know, XML and now has been sort of transformed into a JSON kind of a thing. But really the, the end result is on the right. So I've got code um, for the first part of this that walks, that basically parses the sticks um, and walks the graph to basically answer that question. You know, for this particular CVE 2017-0199, these are the various groups that are attacking that. So the next part of this is I'm working on uh, the importer client to be able to import this data into attacker KB um, to be able to highlight that in each of the topics as a means of showing hey, this is relevant, this has been attacked. Um, oh, by the way, these are some kind of older CVEs. Um, and then eventually, as part of the uh, Cynic API or the GraphQL work Louis has been doing is to be able to send this over to the IBM uh, product as well. So that, um, you know, back to that original part of the story, which is to prioritize the, uh, you know, fixing of vulnerabilities. That's always one of the, the, big, the big questions. So that's kind of where it's at in a nutshell. I've got the code to parse and create the data and now I'm working on the importer part and we'll soon have that data um, in Attacker KB. Excellent.